Eight. Godfrey fought on mechanically, cutting down goblin after goblin as they tried to climb from the trench. But his mind remained with Dargin on the right wing. The goblin savagery was not so mindless after all. A flanking attack, using troops that could maneuver vertical terrain. There was a mind behind this assault, a dangerous mind, one that must be destroyed before it destroyed them. A bolt of green lightning shot down from above, booming loud and blasting Arn and a few of his hammerers off their feet. Godfrey looked up. The shaman's shimmering green cloud hovered above them. Another bolt shot from it, and another. Crackling energy slammed Godfrey to the ground like the slap of a giant green hand. It rippled over his armor and froze his joints. His teeth ached with it. And his arms stuck out stiff from his sides, rigid, as he hissed and cursed. Rodrin and the rest were the same, lying twisted and clutching the ground, as green flickers danced over their bodies. A last bolt, and the shimmering cloud vanished like a mirage, leaving only jagged lines on the inside of Godfrey's eyelids. Shrill cheers filled his ears as he raised his head. The goblins were surging up out of the trench, and swarming towards the fallen dwarves. Godfrey raised his shield and blocked the spear thrust, then cut his opponent's legs from under it with fagstock. He struggled to his feet, cursing and slashing, surrounded. All around him, his dwarves were in the same straits, chest deep in a swirling swamp of scrawny green horrors. Arn went down under the tide. A goblin stabbing him in the face with a dagger. Damn that shaman! His pitiful spell hadn't killed a single dwarf. Magic never bothered dwarfs much, yet it had distracted them long enough to allow the goblins to get in amongst them. They were already flowing behind the brewery ramparts and attacking the backs of the defenders there. The dwarf line was broken. It would be impossible to stem the tide. Fall back," he called. "Blow the horn! Back to the second trench." Dagscar nodded, pleased, as he surveyed the battle. All over the settlement, the dwarves were falling back to rearward positions. The mill, the brewery, the grain storehouses were all his. It was going well. What a mess! Cried Nasbot beside him. We is getting slaughtered. Dagscar scowled at him. What battle is you watching? We've got them on the run. But they is killing five of us for every one of them we kills. Good thing we got six of us for every one of them, ain't it? Dagscar laughed. If it did the trick, I would waste twice as many. He shrugged dismissively, then grinned as he looked over the stunty lines. The real killing is gonna start now, anyway. It's time for the troll. But as he turned to call for the troll, a babble of angry goblin voices rose up to his left, and he saw a mess of night goblins and spider riders surging towards each other around the corpse wagon, fists swinging and daggers slashing. What's all this? He roared and charged towards the brawl, uncoiling his whip as he went. Kizaz trotted after him, the banner swaying crazily above him. Oi! Cried Nasbad, turning as well. Lay off! He ran for the fray too. Dagscar waded into the fight, cracking his whip and pulling goblins off each other. You can't fight here," he shouted. "This is a battle." A spider rider was strangling a night goblin. Dagscar whipped the rider across the shoulders, cutting deep. "Get off!" The goblin turned, snarling, and hacked at him with a hand axe. Dagscar caught the axe and twisted it from his hand, then buried it in the goblin's head. A hard hand spun him around. 
and he found himself eye to eye with Nasbad. What was that? rasped the shaman. You killed one of my boys. And he was killing one of my boys. The shaman snarled and held up his hand, middle finger extended, wart glowing. Do you want me to give you the finger? I ain't gonna stand for this. Bagscar had had enough. The shaman had done what he needed him to do. He had broken the dwarf line. Now he was just in the way. Dagscar lashed out with his axe and cut off the raised finger at the root. It spun away in a spray of black blood, the green glow of its wart fading as the shaman shrieked and fell back. My finger! He yelled. You cut off my wart finger! Dagscar leapt after him, aiming another axe blow at the head, but the shaman blocked with his staff and countered with a crack to the shins. All around them, the night goblins and spider riders threw themselves at each other in a rage, coming to the defense of their leaders. Kill the overgrounders! cried Dagsgar. They is breaking the pact! Call the boys back! Nasbot bellowed to a rider with a horn around his neck. We has been betrayed! At the fallback line, this one flanked by the forge and the stonecutter's workshop, Godri, Rodrin, and the surviving hammerers were filling another trench with dead goblins. Godri had seen a dozen dwarfs fall as they retired to the new position, and knew that dozens more must have died all along the perimeter of the settlement, but the retreat had been orderly and their lines still held. Even Bori Graniteskin had fallen back with the rest, when the goblins had set fire to the brewery, and now fought side by side with Godry. By Grimnir, I'll not fall to a goblin spear, he'd growled when the others had teased him for retreating. That's not a doom worthy of a slayer. I'm waiting for the troll. A gabble of harsh horns sounded from behind the goblin lines, all blowing different phrases. Godry didn't know what they meant, and it seemed the goblins didn't either. Some of them looked back, seemingly confused. Others turned and tried to retreat, while still others continued forward. Scuffles and shoving matches broke out amongst them. The dwarves were not hesitant to take advantage of their enemy's confusion, decapitating turned heads and cutting down goblins that were already fighting each other. This is it, wheezed Rodrin, grinning. They've fallen out. They'll collapse any minute. A cheer went up from the right. Godry looked down the lines to see the spider riders retreating from Dargan's lines, skittering back towards the command position with musket shot peppering their backs. Dargan's lads started after them, cutting through the goblins before them and roaring with bloodlust. Godry cursed. No, the fool! Don't be drawn! He turned to his trumpeter. Blow, hold fast! Hurry! The trumpeter blasted out the call, repeating it again and again, and at last Dargan's lads halted their advance. But Godry could see that they were surrounded by goblins now, and fighting on all sides, while more greenskins poured through the gap they had left. Godry looked back. He had only a handful of reserves left. Go! He shouted at them. Shore up the right! He ground his teeth. If any other part of the line broke, they would have to fall back to the king's wall. And from there there was no retreating. A dead night goblin flew through the air flung like a ragdoll by one of the hulkiest spiders in the center of the brawl. The goblin crashed in a heap beside the wagon, almost directly at Skari's feet. Skari stared. It was a gift from his ancestors, for the goblin was still clutching his spear. Skari looked around cautiously, but his guards had long abandoned their posts to join the scrap. No one was watching him. 
he stretched forward and hooked the haft of the spear with a questing boot toe, then drew it back and raised it carefully to waist height. He caught it in his numbed fingers and propped it against the tailgate of the wagon, then leaned on it to keep it steady. Another quick look around. The goblins were still at it, though it would be over soon. Only a few last spider riders fought on, defending their leader. Scarry would have to work fast, while they were still distracted. He put his bound wrists to the jagged edge of the spear tip, and began to saw. Dagscar had to hand it to Nasbad. Even without his wordfinger and his wa, the pot-bellied little shaman could fight. He'd blocked him strike for strike, while all around them their boys tore each other apart. Dagscar was bleeding all over from the sharp bits at the end of Nasbad's staff, and his head was swimmy from all the knocks. But he had given as good as he got. The shaman was covered in whip stripes and blade cuts, and he was missing an ear and the first three inches of his nose. Finally, Dagscar got in a lucky shot with his stunty sticker and chopped Nasbad's staff in two, and the shaman stumbled back, disarmed. He held up his nine fingers in supplication. Give us a break here, Scrapper. It was just a misunderstanding. You know how it is. The boys get rowdy sometimes. Daxcar kicked the shaman down and stood on his throat. So does I, brother. So does I. And with that, he stabbed straight down with his stunty sticker and buried it between Nazbot's beady little eyes. The shaman twitched, then slumped loose as dark blood oozed up around the edges of the sword. Dagscar wrenched it free and looked up. All around him his boys were finishing off the last of the spiders and the spider riders. He grinned. That was just fine. The forest boys had done what he needed them to do. They'd got him across the bridge, and tore up the stunty lines from behind. He didn't need them any more. Good work, boys, he shouted. Now we don't gotta share the spoils with them. He raised his whip and shook it. Now get back to the stunties, you lazy layabouts. The goblins squealed with bloodlust and ran back towards the dwarf line. Dagscar nodded after them, satisfied, then turned away. Now, where was I? He waved to the boys who were watching the troll. Oi, bring the dummy over and get him on the wagon. He started towards the wagon. And where's that sneaky little stunty? He stopped. The captured dwarf was gone. His ropes lay limp on the ground. Dagscar cursed. The plan wasn't going to work without a dwarf. He scrambled up to the top of the corpse wagon and looked around anxiously. Scarry held his breath as he crept for the long grass in the fallow field next to the pasture. Once there, he could crawl unseen to the dwarf lines and join the fight where it mattered. He chuckled at his own cleverness and good fortune. The spider riders were all dead their threat removed from the battlefield. And it was him who had done it, and all with a cowpat. He'd even managed to escape in the confusion, an added bonus he hadn't expected. Now perhaps he could find more ways to make up for his incompetence and folly. He breathed a sigh of relief as he reached the fallow field and began to push through the tall stalks. He was safe now. He... A soft noise behind him made him freeze. Had that been a footfall? He turned his head, but before he could see anything, a weight slammed him to the ground, and something jagged and sharp pressed into his neck. Feated mushroom breath made him wince as a leering voice whispered in his ear, Going back to your mates, are ya? A harsh cackle nearly deafened him. That's just what you'll do. Godry and Rodrin and Bori Graniteskin fought side by side 
before a surging press of goblins. Godri's arms were weary, his Gromrel armor seemed to weigh a ton, and the goblin horde hadn't collapsed like Rodrin had predicted it would. Nonetheless, he was cautiously optimistic. After the scare on the right flank, the dwarves had regrouped well, and were holding their positions all along the line. There were many dead, but those that remained still fought with heart, and did not waver. The same could not be said for the goblins. The squabbling at the rear of their position seemed to have died down, but the horde hadn't recovered. They no longer fought with their earlier seething rage or oneness of purpose, and Godry could see that they were growing tired of throwing themselves against the dwarfs' unbreakable wall of shields. They looked ready to turn around and go home. He hoped it was soon. A movement from beyond the greenskin line caught his eye as he bashed down another goblin with his shield. He stared. A wagon was speeding straight for them. A dwarf wagon, with a dwarf driver shaking the reins, and the ponies galloping as if possessed. It looked as if it were piled high with dwarf dead. Who? he said, squinting at the driver, trying to make out the face. And what was that beside him? It's the cowherd, cried Rodrin. Scarry Otkinson, and, and he has Auric with him. Godry looked again as the wagon raced closer, and his heart soared. Rodrin was right. Beside the cowherd on the wagon's bench lay his son, his head in Scarry's lap, the axe Grudgender held slack in his hand. Godry couldn't tell if Auric was alive or dead. It didn't matter. His son was returned to him. Break the line, he roared. Let them through, let them through. The ponies trampled straight through the goblin ranks as the dwarves parted to let them pass. Godry thought he saw a goblin leap from between them and roll away at the last second, but it might have been flung up by their crushing hooves. Godry and Rodrin backed out of the dwarf line as Bori the Slayer and the remaining hammerers closed the gap and faced the goblins again. Godry's heart pounded with anticipation as he and his brother hurried to the wagon. It was only as he got closer that he noticed that the cowherd looked strange. He had a rag stuffed in his mouth, and his hands were bound to the reins. Not only that, he was tied to the bench, as was his son. The beardling tried to say something, eyes rolling wildly, trying to say something through the rag. What is this, lad? asked Godry, drawing his dagger. What's happened to you? He stepped up onto the wagon and cut Scarry's hands free of the reins, then pulled the rag from his mouth. It's a trap! shouted Scarry. It's a trap! Get away! Suddenly, from the bed of the wagon, a huge shape surged up shrugging off the dead dwarves that had covered it like dry leaves. The troll! It roared with bestial rage and raised a club the size of an ancestor stone over its ugly head. Godry threw himself backward as the massive weapon came down and slammed into the wagon, but he wasn't fast enough. The end of it mashed his shoulder and he crumpled to the ground, his mind whirling and black with pain. Through the agony he heard shocked cries and angry bellows. Defend the Thane! Get him away! Hold the line! Brother, do you live? Back off, you weaklings! The troll is mine! Dagscar cackled as he saw the dwarf line collapse in the middle, the troll wreaking havoc among them. This is what he had been waiting for. He turned to his reserves, who were straining forward like squigs on a leash. What are you waiting for? He shrieked. Tear them apart! The boys howled with glee and streamed forward, waving their spears and choppers. Scarry lay in a tangle of ropes and reins, 
barely conscious and hanging half off the wagon, still loosely bound to the shattered bench. The troll's club had come down inches from him, smashing the bench and stunning him. Then the big beast had leapt over him, roaring and swinging at faint thunderbrand. He raised his head to find himself surrounded by a nightmare. A hammerer screamed as the troll's club flattened him to a grisly pancake. Another was crawling away, using only his hands. His legs crushed to a paste. Rodrin and another hammerer were dragging the thane away, back towards the hold. Godry slumped between them, unconscious or dead, his gromril armor crushed and torn at the shoulder. The slayer was trying to pull a firepot over his head, while dodging behind the troll and roaring for its attention. And beyond the chaos, all along the lines, dwarves were turning and running to help, while the goblins surged through the gaps, shrieking with delight. The dwarf's defense was collapsing, and it was all his fault. Tears of rage and shame came to Skari's eyes as he struggled to free himself from the slack ropes that held him to the bench. He should have thrust his neck forward when the goblin put his blade against it. He should have killed himself before he let this happen. Instead, he had frozen with fear and let the evil little savage bind him to the wagon and sent him off with a buried troll in tow, an innocent-looking package with death inside. He gave an angry tug on his ropes and fell to the ground with a thud as they finally unraveled. Goblins and dwarves fought all around him, with the troll and the slayer performing a mad dance in the middle that sent all the rest scattering. The troll kept slamming its club at the slayer, and the slayer kept rolling away and hacking it across the back of the legs, cursing and bellowing all the while. He was still having trouble getting the strap of the firepot off over his head, so his actions looked strangely comical. Skari pushed himself to his feet in the lee of the wagon, looking for a weapon as the mad melee swirled around him. He had to join the fight. He had to make amends, even in the smallest way, for all the terrible things his actions and inactions had caused. He saw that poor dead Auric lay beside him, his axe grudgender still clutched in his hand. Skari nearly wept at the sight. Instead, he knelt and pried the precious axe from his feigned son's fingers. With a cry of triumph, the slayer at last pulled the strap of the firepot over his head and cocked his arm back to throw it. The troll spun around, swinging its club for Bori's head. The slayer leapt aside again, but this time he was just a second too slow. The club grazed his hip and sent him spinning through the air to crash down next to the wagon. The firepot bounced out of his hand at the impact and rolled across the ground, almost under the troll's feet. Skari stared at the clay pot as the monster strode towards the fallen slayer. This was it. This was what he could do. Without fire, the troll was nearly unkillable. Its wounds closed almost as quickly as they were made. But fire cooked its flesh and made it impossible for it to knit together again. Skari might not be able to kill it himself, but he could make sure someone else could do the job. The slayer rolled under the cart as the troll pounded the ground where he had been. Now! Skari short-hafted Grajender, then sprinted past the troll as it lifted the cart and heaved it aside. The firepot lay at the angle in the grass next to a massive footprint, its little flame guttering under its open-sided cap. Skari snatched it up and turned. The slayer was diving away from another club smash, but his bruised leg buckled as he landed. The troll's swipe had hurt him. He arrived on the ground. Skari ran forward. Troll! He screamed. Turn and face your doom! He flung the firepot at the monster's broad scaly back. The clay vessel smashed on its knobby spine, and oil splashed everywhere then exploded with a wump of flame as the fumes caught. 
The troll screamed and twisted, dropping its club and slapping ineffectually at its back as it turned. Skari raised Grajander and charged, bellowing his clan's name. The troll snatched him up like he was a doll and crushed him in its monstrous grip. He could feel his ribs snap like twigs. He hacked down at its wrist with oryx axe and made a deep cut. The troll howled and threw him down. His skull hit something hard. Bright agony spiked like lightning through his brain. The world swam before him, and he felt his color grow heavy and sticky. He raised a shaking hand to the back of his head. There was a hole where there shouldn't be. Blood was pouring out of it like a river. The troll loomed above him, its head on fire as it reached for him. Then Bori slammed into it, roaring and hacking. The troll caught the slayer and raised him high, tearing at him with its huge hands. Bori's axe flashed. The troll fell. So did Bori. Both were headless. Skari chuckled painfully as his vision dimmed. He had fought with Bori Granitskin when he'd first met him. Now he would walk with him to the halls of their ancestors. They had killed the troll and though that single act might not have saved the day, they had still died valiantly, trying to erase their shame. And to the spirits of their fathers, that was all that mattered. Skari was content.